There we go. Oh, I'm still getting good feedback. That's the, my, my exposure to Microsoft people. Every time you say anything to them, they say, oh, that's good feedback. And it took me about five years to learn that that means, please go away. <laughs> yes, yeah, C++, I think, can be complicated. I think that's fair. Um, in the spring, Jens put a poll on Twitter. I don't know if any of you remember or saw it or answered it. He asked, what is your relationship with C++? But then he had these boring options, like I program full-time, I program part-time, I'm a student. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's complicated, right? That's the Facebook answer. That's my relationship with C++. I think for a lot of us, that's our relationship with C++. Like, you love it, but you hate parts of it, but you love it, but you defend it to other people, but you complain about it amongst your tribe, right? <clears throat> so I thought I'd start out by talking about how long I've been doing this, because I've been paid to program since 1979, and that's a long time. And I didn't start in C++, and some of you may be able to figure out why in 1979 I didn't start in C++. The first language I ever learned was called uh, Watt 5, and really I think this started me on a bad road, not because of the language, because of the name. I was at the University of Waterloo. <clears throat> and the nice folks at the University of Waterloo made an implementation of Fortran, which they called What For, for Waterloo Fortran, which is also kind of a bit of a joke in English, like you could threaten someone and say, I'll give you What For. Um, so that was fine, they called it What For, but then when they needed a new version, did they call it What For too? Oh no, they called it What Five. And that right there, that started a thing. We are, we're terrible at naming, right? But we also have all these weird, nerdy jokes, and I kind of, think for me, being taught what five with a straight face by a university professor is sort of what started me there. And it was called what five S for structured, because structured programming was a brand new and exciting thing in 1977. And I would go to job interviews and people would be like, explain the principles of structured programming. And if you did it well, they'd offer you the job. So for those of you who don't remember the principles of structured programming, it was like anti-spaghetti code. So it was like you should only have one return statement in a function. And you should declare all your variables at the top of the function and that kind of thing. Okay. When I started working as a co-op student, I was introduced to PL1. Anyone ever work with PL1? Oh, good. Some old people sitting towards the back like me. <coughs> First of all, it was the, your second computer language is good for you because then you suddenly understand the commonality, right? You're like, oh, we had this in that other language too. But something they had in PL1 that I thought was amazing was that you could have an array, like a matrix, a two by two, 10 by 10, whatever array. And in PL1, that was a thing. So I could say like A equals B. Whereas in Fortran, I would have had to write nested loops to copy each element of B into A. And this was obviously like way less error prone and super cool, and the idea that uh, types could be more than just numbers was kind of changed everything for me. So I probably couldn't write any PL1 today, but it was very important to me. Then I finally got to meet C++. I, I had to work out, when did I start writing C++? I should be able to say, I've been writing C++ for this long. But the thing is, I didn't realize it was a momentous occasion, right? I just needed to do something, and this was a language I could do it in, so I kind of figured out how to do a little bit of it. But I have worked it out because it was while I was a graduate student, so it was after 1986, but it was definitely before my first child was born, which was 1989, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it was even before she was conceived. So I'm gonna say that it was 1987, because then I can say it's been 30 years. <laughs> I did learn basic, like not, Visual Basic, but Basic Basic, and then later Visual Basic. And I did a fair amount of work in those languages. They were, they were good ways to make certain kinds of applications. I did spend some time in Java. I even taught Java and intro to Java. And I did Corba, and all of that is awful. So, uh, I did some C Sharp. It was sort of a natural transition uh, from VB uh, over to C Sharp, which Microsoft definitely liked better. But then I was lucky. Uh, enough to be able to always still have been doing a little bit of C++ all the way along. And about 10 years ago, I just kind of shed all those other things and started doing nothing but C++ and became a happier person. 
But then something really, really strange happened. And there's some younger people here, so you may not have noticed it. But the language changed, right? The language hadn't changed. 03 doesn't even really count. 03 was like an errata to 98, right? So the language hadn't changed for 10 or 15 years, and suddenly it was like, here's some new syntax and new keywords and new things that we couldn't do before. And it, we were, I was like a kid at Christmas for a while there. I was having such a great time. And then the language changed again. You're like, wait. <laughs> so again, 14 was sort of a bug fix. This fall, yeah, we forgot make unique and things like that. But like 17's got actual real new stuff that you have to learn about, right? If you, if you came to Jason's talk and you not only have to learn that a particular new keyword has been added, but is it worth using? Does it make your code better, defined better, all of that? And now we have to get our heads in a mode of learning new stuff all the time. And it's a natural enough question to wonder is that actually what we're supposed to be doing? So I thought I'd ask a series of questions about C++. When C++ 11 came out, a bunch of us went around saying, we added things to C++ to make it simpler. Anyone hear that before? It was a popular trope. Is it true? So I'm only asking at the moment. What does it mean to be a good C++ developer? You know, do you have to understand all the complicated parts of C++? All the edge cases, all the corner cases, all the sharp corners, all the bits that'll hurt you if you go in there. Do you just need to know to stay away from them or do you really need to understand them? You know, how important is it to have that full and total knowledge? Is it okay that I just know 80% but it's the 80% I need to know and I come in in the morning and I write my code and I go home and life is good. And just how much of this language are you supposed to learn before you start to use it? Jens mentioned that I, I did talk at CPPCon about the guidelines and I, I'm actually going to get around to talking about the guidelines this morning. So let's ask this question as well. Is it possible to write simple guidelines for how to write C++, that's good. I learned C++ to solve some very specific problem that I had. I needed to solve multiple partial differential equations. I needed to do some numerical integration because the tools that were available to me, a Mathematica and MATLAB and something called Maple, couldn't handle my equations. So I wrote some numerical integration because I needed to do these equations. I didn't want to learn the language for itself. I wanted to solve my problem. But as time went by, I became someone who wanted to learn the language. And I sort of observed this pattern. When you first start, it's like you're just outside a building. And you think, I have to get in there. I need to be inside the building of people who, in this case, know C++. So what do I have to learn? So I'm going to learn all the syntax of the language. And then you realize that in C++, that's not enough. You also have to learn the standard library, right? Like you literally can't make characters appear on the screen unless you start to learn the standard library. Okay, I learn all of this and I'm inside. I'm a C++ programmer, Woohoo! I'm with my tribe. Oh look, <laughs> over in that far wall, there's another door. So what am I gonna learn now that I'm inside? Maybe I'll learn the standardization process. Who's who in our community? Who's on the committee? There's papers going on. Okay, I'll go through the door. I've learned all that stuff. I'm an insider now. And you know what you see? <laughs> Another door. Oh yeah, I don't know build systems. I don't know, that guy knows way more compiler flags than I do. And the linker, I'm impressed by how much that other person over there knows about the linker. And oh yeah, you're supposed to know template metaprogramming. And there's all these other languages or libraries that are not standard, but that you're supposed to know that other people know. Like I still, to this day, I'm very guilty. I don't know any cute. I'll just hold my hand up to that. But maybe you also, you should know some, some boost, right? There are all these things that you're supposed to know. In fact, there's not just one door at the other end of this room. There's a bunch of different doors for all the different directions you could go learning in. 
and you think, well, I need to be part of the in crowd. I need to know all there is to know, so I'm going to learn more, and I'm going to qualify to go through more and more doors. But, you know, there's, I have yet to reach a room that doesn't have more doors in it, right? No matter how much I learn, I can learn more. No matter how much I learn, there's something that the person next to me knows that I don't, that I can feel either jealous or guilty about, I don't know it all yet. And so, as you judge yourself, how am I doing, am I okay? One of the reactions that I started to have was, well, you know, those people who know more than me, they're just showing off. <coughs> who's, on the, who's on the CPP Slack? That's not enough hands, people, that's like a third of the room. You need to join the CPP Slack. It is an amazing community. If you're not on it, you keep hearing people tell you you should join it. You don't know what the point is. Um, a large part of the point is that it's a supportive and helpful community. When I actually have problems that I want to know something, I get my answers within like minutes, okay? It can also be fun and a, a way to make friends with other people in the community, but people are getting jobs, solving real problems, all of those things because they join the Slack. But people can also get pretty intense conversations going, and because you have to type, people type abbreviations for things. So I collected some over a period of just one day earlier when I was preparing this talk. So if you recognize these, let me know. This is uh, almost always auto. <laughs> undefined behavior, or my favorite Slack response, no, says someone, that's not undefined behavior, that's unspecified behavior. <laughs> Both you be. RVO, which has like five other names, as you know. Uh, LTO, link time optimization, ADL, NDR, and again, a great Slack. No, that's not from NDR. That was for ODR. I'll get to that in a minute. Well, we have, of course, the catchphrase, const all the things, which someone had to go one better in const x for all the things. <laughs> Sphene, I went to a talk that said Sphene functionality is not arcane esoterica. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. I, 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 L, E, and some people don't put the third I in, is an immediately invoked initializing lambda expression. ODR, leading again to a Slack comment, like, oh, sure, it was used, but it wasn't ODR used. I mean, you can imagine, like, you've just learned the language. You're pretty sure about remember to put semicolons in your for loops, and you get caught up in a conversation where someone's like, well, it wasn't ODR used. Oh, yeah, like, sorry, my fault. <laughs> but do you need to know all this stuff? Like, if you don't know some of these initials, or if you know what they stand for, but you don't know why they matter, if you, if you don't know which of these are little kind of idioms and habits and twerks and which of these are language features, can you do a good job? So I want to tell you kind of a long story. Luckily, I have time. I was brought in to help a team that had an MFC application. So this is like Microsoft's wrappers around Windows 32. So there's a class called button and a class called you know, drop-down box and whatnot. And they had built this MFC application to do a very, very specific thing. It ran a benchmark. And this is a benchmark that's actually determined by a committee, the Transactions Processing hmm, Council Committee, something that starts with C, the TPC. And they have like TPC-whatever for their official benchmarks for databases. And the team that I was doing this for made a database. So they were kind of in the habit of running this benchmark and saying, version X point Y of our database now gets 172 on this you know, known official benchmark. And that uh, presumably enabled them to sell copies of their database and to beat Oracle. Although Oracle's strategy of taking people to play golf seemed to be a better one longer term. <laughs> they wanted to update this application so that they could benchmark any workload. So a variety of different TPC benchmarks, but that they could always also invent their own benchmarks and then run them against different versions of their engine or uh, on-prem versus cloud or what have you. This is early in the days of, of cloud-based database servers. So at the beginning of the project, for those of you who have not had the joy of meeting an MFC application, uh, this is why we made up the word monolithic. So you would have like a piece of code that was literally the handler for a button click. 
And it would not be four lines long. It would be 400 lines long. That would be full of you know, difficult, hard business logic all in the button click handler. And then there'd be another 100 lines of code in some drop-down box handler. And these, they were always kind of like this. And so they wanted, on top of being able to swap the engine out to hold any workload, they wanted to update the user interface. So that's going to be fun, right? But they did have a core piece of C++ that they called the engine, and they wanted to keep that engine in pure C++. So we came up with an architecture involving a C Sharp so that we could build a glowy jelly donut button thing with transparency all in WPF, engine in pure C++, and then a translation layer in between in Microsoft's um, managed C++. And there's like about six people who don't work for Microsoft who can do anything in that language because it's had zero attention. And I'm one of them, so I had to do this project. But I wanted to preserve all of the code in the engine because I didn't understand it. I don't know how to run benchmarks. I don't know anything about writing a database. So I definitely didn't want to touch this code if I could help it. <sighs> okay, I'm going to walk you through the main loop of the engine. It started badly. It started with a label. <laughs> so you know, somewhere, someone's going to this label, right? After the label, we were doing creating things, making database connections, opening files, that kind of stuff, setup. And there were some tries, catches in there, and there was a go-to exit thread loop. So you know now there's, there's another label somewhere, right? Then we had a while true. I'm not a big fan of the while true, but it got worse. <laughs> and then it did it again. OK. In here, stuff happens. People are trying to do things. Sometimes exceptions were thrown. Sometimes we just broke out of the loop. Sometimes we did a go to. It varied. After the loops, we had the catch blocks. There were like seven catch blocks, like literally multiple pages. I was printing them out and drawing on them with different colors of highlighter. <laughs> Inside the, uh, the catches, in, the, tr uh, in the, the catch block, there would be if. And most of the time, the if would do some work, and then it would be like, go to reconnect. Yes, you're in a try block. Go to up above a loop. That's fun. Or uh, go to exit thread loop, which did some more cleanup. Hundreds and hundreds of lines of code. I spent like a day just trying to understand what was going on. It's a typical, in, this is not a whole catch block, but the sort of thing that they had in a catch block. If, that's Hungarian notation, for those who haven't met it before, it starts with a little b to indicate that it is a Boolean. Are we having fun yet? That, that kind of comes back to my Fortran. If you haven't worked in Fortran, um, it was a strongly typed language, but you didn't get to choose the types. So if the variable started, and I'm not making this up, with the letters i through n, it was an integer. And if the otherwise, it was a float or a double or something, a real. OK, so it was great. You want to have a loop on i or on n, they'll be integers. And if you wanted to have something called like limit, that's fine. It magically is an integer. If you needed your, your limit to be uh, not an integer, then you'd call it like f limit, because that's what you would do. And, and kind of born out of this came the Hungarian notation in C++, which isn't required, but was supposed to help humans. So if you need to release the semaphore, well, then you should release the semaphore. And you'll notice I'm passing multiple parameters to this release semaphore. And then, of course, you need to set the flag back to false, because you don't need to release it anymore. And you know why it's capitals false? Because the code precedes the bool type, right? So that's number sign defined to zero. And then uh, do some more cleanup, again, passing bits and pieces. And, and you notice they're different bits and pieces, right? So with this H transaction currency, H for handle, so it's some sort of handle. But then we have a transaction record, which has bits and pieces that get passed to error message. And all of the catch blocks were like this. Do I need to clean up thing X? Oh, well, then I guess I'll clean up thing X and say that I no longer need to. And of course, you have to say you no longer need to, because you're probably going to go to reconnect or something if the number of retries is not too bad. And this is a small one. I chose a small one that would fit on the slide. So 
Now think politically for a minute. I'm the consultant, I've been brought in to rip somebody's baby into little pieces, stick a new face on it, and it'll all be fine. And we've promised him, you can keep your C++ engine. But then I looked at his engine loop, and I made some faces. <laughs> so he knows I don't like it. But he wrote it, and he's my age, and super smart, knows more about databases than anyone I've ever met, also about opera. Um, and I need to tell him that his baby's kind of ugly. <laughs> and he already knows it's taken me forever to understand this loop. It's, it's, he's had to explain parts of it to me a ton of times. So finally, I said to him, this really needs some RAII. You know what he said? What's our AII? He'd been programming in C++ for over 20 years. He had C++ applications in production. He was not inexperienced or uneducated or unaware, but he had never heard this name. So I said, well, it stands for resource acquisition is initialization. Astonishingly enough, that did not help. We really suck at names, okay? We really, really do. And then, so noticing the blankness, I said, oh, well, really, it should be called initialization is resource acquisition. That also did not help. <laughs> now, at this point, if I had said to him, it's a thing I like to do that makes my C++ programs better, I think he would have stopped listening. But I was able to say, it's an accepted idiom in the C++ community. I know the name is terrible, but I'm pretty sure it was Bjarna who came up with it, so we're not allowed to say it's terrible. <laughs> and then I went to the whiteboard, and if any of you have ever tried to teach somebody RAII, it takes about five minutes. I think I did the file, right? So we open it in the constructor, we close it in the destructor, you can't forget to close it, because when it closes, it'll go out of scope on its own. You can't forget to open it, because the only way you get one is if you succeed in getting through the constructor and a light bulb went off, I told you he's a smart guy, and he says to me, you don't understand all my semaphores and mutexes and connections and what can be retried and what can't, but I get it. So you work on that WPF C-sharp front end thing for a week. He did the whole thing. So a week later, let's regroup, how are we doing? The loop was one page long. All that hundreds of lines of crap fell away. And all of the whiles stopped being while true. And they were like, while number of retries is less than retry limit. And while state is not requested cancellation. You could read it. It made sense. And the most astonishing thing, there were no catch blocks, zero. They had been catching connection timed out exceptions and uh, just dozens of different kinds of exceptions and then doing the same cleanup in all of them, like, well, did I successfully construct this? I should totally destruct it then. It all went away. And you could actually see what the loop did. You could see that the loop got a connection, read, read in what it was supposed to do, built a structure, shipped the structure over the connection, waited, got an answer back, updated some statistics, and went around again. It was a total win. I was the happiest consultant, and they thought I was really smart because I knew four letters. <laughs> but then an even better thing happened. It, that didn't happen. Right away, he was happy. The loop was short. We went back about our business. But we had a working usable product very early on. And he told me, in the old version, we had some bugs that in the 20 years we've never been able to solve. We couldn't repro them. We had some guesses about what would happen if you timed out immediately after you did such a thing. We could never make them happen. We could never prove it. And when we read the code, we couldn't you know, hypothesize and say, oh, if this was zero, then I can see how we might fall through. But as he was going through and taking those catch 
contents and putting them into destructors. As he was replacing handles and six related things with a single object, he had this light bulb. And he's like, I know why we get that bug. And the bug was gone. Because in particular combinations of errors, they missed one step of the cleanup. And something was still true or still false or still zero or whatever when you, went, you go to reconnect. So the bug could not happen. So now you've got code that everyone can understand and you solved bugs that you've literally been trying for decades to solve. So he was kind of a convert, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not just about making the code shorter. Making the code shorter was super important because now I understood the loop. But there was a whole lot more going on and it had to do with taking that complexity of keeping track of 20 different variables of flags that indicated what you had and hadn't done so far and therefore what you had to undo when you cleaned up. And, and we didn't move it into a library. We kind of made it completely disappear. Or maybe we moved it into the compiler, right? Because when, when your application is running, if an object got successfully constructed, then it's on the stack. And when we need to unwind, it will get destructed. And I don't have to write that code. I'm not writing anything that says, hey, did we manage to get that semaphore? But in a sense, the compiler has done that for me. I really think the fact that RAII was a thing was the secret to that working. I might have had a chance of saying, you know, this is a pattern I like to use and it's worked for me. But at that point in the relationship, I'm not sure that it would have worked. Because it was a known thing, some letters that today people talk about in Slack, they were prepared to listen to it and it made the code better. What's more, me knowing that pattern made the code better compared to this very smart person who didn't know that pattern. So it's easy to say that something like an immediately invoked initializing lambda expression is just showing off. But done right, these things are actually for a purpose, which is to give you better code. So maybe half the people in Slack are just showing off when they're talking about these, but the other half are actually writing better code from it. So while it's tempting to say, I don't really need to learn that, there can be some very powerful benefits from it. So I think it's good to write simple code. And I thought, well, I should tell people how to write simple code, which turns out not to be a simple thing to do. So here's a first pass of some principles. The first thing you want to do is to hide complexity and to move complexity. And that may be all that you can do. So taking all those if statements out of all those catches and all those manually releasing and freeing and whatnotting, and instead putting them into destructors, that moved some of the complexity and it hid some of the complexity. Or you could argue that it maybe completely eliminated it. And when we embrace abstraction and we encapsulate some of our details behind an abstraction, maybe we're completely eliminating that complexity because the person who reads the code doesn't need to worry their pretty little head about the insides of those objects. It's just the objects to look after themselves. And as a bonus, we'll keep in mind that when you make your code simpler and when you add abstractions, in addition to making you a happier developer, it may also reduce your bugs. The reason it makes you a happier developer is because readability absolutely matters. We write code once, we read it 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times. If you have a 20-year-old code base, how many times have some of the lines of code in there been read, read by a human being who's trying to figure out what to do next? 1,000 is perhaps an underestimate. And names are probably the most important thing that we can do. We have names for our patterns and idioms. We have names for our variables. We have names for our functions. We have names for our types. And this is something that I think sets C++ apart from other languages, the extent to which we can make a type that's truly a type. So you can use names for no other reason than to tell things apart, as a tag, for example. But we have a name for a type. That type is really a true type. And it matters that you know things. It matters that you know your language. It matters that you know your idioms, your patterns, and the libraries you can use. But this is a C++ conference, man. You all know the language, right? 
maybe. I'm going to show you something from the talk I did at CppCon. And I'm going to show it to you as though you haven't seen it. So if you've seen it, just play along, OK? It's an example about adding caching to a class, OK? So this is a class called stuff. It's got two member variables in it, a number called number one, that's an integer, and another number called number two, that's a double. And it does something. And I'm not sure how it's able to do this through the magic of slideware. I can do a very computationally expensive thing with these two numbers, OK? It takes forever. It keeps the computer very busy. I have a constructor for my class. I have two non-const functions, service one and service two, that do something, whatever the service is that stuff offers to the world. And I have get value. And in the initial implementation, all get value does is return long, complicated calculation. So you're living here, and this is all working, and it's good. And you'll notice that it's const correct. So neither long, complicated calculation nor get value change either number one or number two. A pretty common pattern. So we do some profiling because we're good people and we never optimize based on guessing. And we establish that long, complicated calculation is actually hurting the performance of the application. So we add caching to it. So we go and add a private integer to hold the result of long, complicated calculation. And we arbitrarily initialize it to 0. And then whenever anyone sets number 1 or number 2, as it turns out, service 1 sets number 1 and service 2 sets number 2, we recalculate the cached value. And you can argue, and you're probably not wrong, that I should recalculate the cached value in the constructor. It's possible. Anyway, anyone changes number one, we update the cache. Anyone changes number two, we update the cache. And now we just return the cached value. So that's correct. It's good behavior. And this works really well for things that are read, that is, we call get value, much more often than they are written. So it's not a hard calculation, but imagine on the screen of your phone, they tell you what day it is today. You look at that many times a day. Certainly, your display writes that thousands and thousands of times a day, but only changes every 24 hours. So it's a good pattern. Only when we change the underlying uh, components that contribute to the number do we actually do our expensive calculation. There are cases, though, where we write far more often than we read. Um, example I think I gave before was if you're doing your timesheets, you're a group of 10 people, you all update your timesheets 5 to 10 times a day as you move from task to task, so that's like 50 to 100 writes, but your manager only looks at the timesheets once a week, so that's like maybe 500 writes for one read. So this pattern where you recalculated everybody's total hours all the time would be kind of wasteful because the manager is only looking once a week. So for them, we say, we'll only update the cache when people go to use it. So we just add a flag about whether the cache is currently valid or not. We start it out as false. This also spares us from having to do the long, complicated calculators in the constructor. And all the two services do is they just invalidate the cache. Someone's changed number one. Whatever the cache value was is no good anymore. Five minutes later, somebody changes number two. The cached value is still no good. Five minutes later, we change number one again and again and again. Finally, once a week, somebody calls get value, and we say, well, if the cache isn't valid, do the calculation and then use the cached value. Anyone see a flaw? Front row, uh, it's working its way back. Yes, it just won't compile. So that's kind of a flaw. You know, I've got to say, when it comes to things that could be wrong with your code, not compiling is a bit of a problem. So it's marked const, and it's changing things. It's pretty straightforward. That's not good. So what are you going to do about it? You need to get your const correctness correct again. So what most people do is like, oh, the compiler says get value can't be const anymore. OK, I'll delete the word const from get value. Problem solved. Philosophically, it's a terrible choice. Right? Somebody did a design that says calling get value doesn't change anything in the class, and we're just going to throw that piece of information away. But the real problem is that somebody somewhere has a stuff that they took by const ref and they call get value on. That used to work, and now you've taken const off it, 
you just broke their code. Well, you know how you fix that. You just go back to that function and just take it by non-const ref. Problem solved. That can go on for a while. That's not a good road to go down. Okay? You end up basically just grepping for const in your code base and deleting them all. So let's not do that. So plan B, we can cast away const. Because it's not really changing the class, really, right? The, cla the cache isn't really part of the class. Some of you are young, you may not have seen a const cast, so I decided I would include one on my slide. Now, if this is disturbing, just hold the hand of someone near you. <laughs> it's traditional when you cast away const to call the non-const pointer that you get this with a capital T. It's just a, it's like how my grandfather did it, okay? So we call const, caf, const cast to a stuff star on little t this, and that gives us big t this. And then we get at the variables through the big t this, the non-const pointer. And this compiles and runs. But it says very clearly in my speaker notes, it's ugly and it's wrong. And it is. It's wrong because it's too powerful. Okay? You can do anything can not just change cache to value and cache valid, you could change number one, you could change number two. And it makes your header file a lie. Your header file says get value doesn't change anything. And you have to go and look in the code for get value to discover that in fact it does change member variables. It can also be undefined behavior in some cases when people aren't just working with const refs to stuff stars but actually have a const stuff. But it doesn't matter. That's the least of my worries. It's just not the right thing to do. So what else could we do? Well, we are C++, not Java, and not C Sharp. And if you ask people about the differences between those languages, sooner or later somebody points out that we distinguish syntactically between a pointer and the thing it points to. Right? And, and, and in most of those other languages, you can't do that. They call them reference semantics, and you really can't do something to the pointer itself. So we could add a pointer to the cache, and the pointer could be const. We would promise not to point it to a different cache, okay? But then we can use the pointer to change what's on the other end of it. And that's apparently not cheating. <laughs> okay. But where did you get a pointer from? It, it can't be an address of some member variable in the class, uh, because again, if the object's really const, that'll be UB. So are you going to get something from the free store? Are you going to call new on something? No. That's a free answer, no. Uh, maybe a unique pointer, right? And then in your constructor, you can, you can call make unique. It's like, it's like not wrong, but it's getting complicated. And I don't like complicated. So you could use the keyword mutable, like this. You label cache value and cache valid as mutable. And you are done. The old code for get value that just, here, just set them, compiles with get value marked as const because that's what mutable means. It means is exempt from const. Now, anyone reading your header file can say, not that long, complicated calculation and get value don't change anything in the class, but that they don't change number one and number two. They might change cached value and cache valid. So without having to read your implementation, your code is totally telling the truth in the header file. You write simpler code because you don't have to cast away const. You don't have to manage that pointer to a cache. You don't have to do any indirections. Your code's going to be faster because it's not zero cycles to do the cast and to do the indirections, right? There is a little bit of a hit. So it's simpler, easier, more maintainable, more readable, faster. There's no downside. Never cast away const. Use mutable. Okay, so this was part of my talk at CppCon a little bit over a month ago. And the response from people who saw the talk included a lot of people who said, basically, that mutable thing is pretty cool. <laughs> and 
Some other people who are like, when did that happen? How long have we had that? Is that like a C++ 11 thing? Is this C++ 17 thing? And I thought, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's pretty sure it's been a long time. So I went on Slack. The Slack is great. Does anyone know when mutable was added to the keyword? And somebody found a PDF of a commit log in which mutable was added. Maybe 1993. It was actually added before const cast, because we could do casting away const with round bracket casts. And I, I've already met someone who is younger than mutable. Hands up if you're younger than mutable, right? <laughs> it's like a non-trivial number of people. And yet, there was also a non-trivial number of people who were like, that's a pretty cool keyword. So it does actually help to know your language completely. Maybe, you know, catch up to the stuff that was added in 1993. Because once you know mutable, your code will be simpler and faster and more maintainable and more pleasant, right? Like, it's not fun to lie. It's not fun to cheat or hack. The whole thing with the bit about the pointers const, but the thing it's pointing to isn't, kind of feels like you need a shower. Why not write the code that feels like you're being honorable and good? And in order to do that, you need to know the whole language. And I didn't think that mutable was a weird dark corner of C++ that most people didn't know, but it turns out that for some people it was. So learning the whole language and the whole of the libraries and the idioms and the patterns has an immediate benefit to the people who didn't know it. Because someone who didn't know mutable and turns into a person who knows mutable is now turning into a person who is naturally going to write better code. So I really wanted to be able to tell you, like, you don't need to learn it all. Just get started. It'll be fine. But I talked myself out of it while I was working on this course because I realized that actually the key to writing good C++ is to actually know C++ and not some tiny subset of it that you got into your head when you started to program and now you're good. All right, we need to learn. Do we get to stop? When have I learned enough? Is, is it never? <laughs> Please tell me it's not never. <laughs> is it five minutes before the new stuff comes out? Like you were caught up, then you went to bed, now you're not caught up again. There are people who, from the way they talk anyway, their goal is to be able to write a compiler. If, if, if they couldn't make a C++ compiler, if their only bottleneck on that is that they they have a life, they have a cat, they have a family. Then they don't know enough yet. Or maybe if you're not gonna write a compiler, maybe you're gonna implement the standard library. Anybody here a standard library implementer? There's always someone. And this happened to me at CppCon. I made some joke about like standard library implementer and then someone came up to me and said, you said it wasn't people like me who did it. Well, I did it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> the rest of us are not standard library implementers. Like, is that a goal, though? Should we be like, I'm not really a C++ developer because I totally couldn't implement the standard library yet? Like, is that, is that fair? Or should you aspire to be able to be on the committee and to be reading those papers and to be the person who stands up and says, well, let me just show you a small code example. And there's like a gasp in the room because it's brought up an edge case that no one's thought of. And then there's arguing. And, you know, can you be that person that makes the room gasp? Is that... Is that an appropriate goal for the level of reading and learning you should achieve? Is it enough that you're confident doing your job? And then, who's heard of Kruger Dunning, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm confident doing my job. Some skills are, you can objectively know if you're any good at them or not. I am terrible at throwing and catching things. And it's partly because girls were not taught to throw things, but it's also partly because I had very academic parents who literally said things like, don't worry, sweetie, gym is for people who aren't that smart. <laughs> so at a time in my life when people would have taught me how to throw and catch things, my parents were like, is there any way she could be doing extra math classes instead of wasting her time with this baseball nonsense? 
but I know I suck at throwing things because if we're on the beach and we're all gonna throw something back and forth and somebody throws it to me and I throw it back and it lands in the sand halfway to that person, it's kind of a clue that my throwing is not what it could be. But there's another set of skills that people can be wrong about how good they are at them. Singing, right? We all have a friend who cannot sing, right? But they're so happy. They're, oh, I love this song. And then they're singing along and you're looking for earplugs. They think they're a good singer. Or a sense of humor. A lot of people think they're much funnier than they are. So is C++ throwing a ball? Or is C++ singing? Right? Can you tell when you're doing it wrong? I actually think it's more on the singing side of things. You can... You know, like Jens was saying, oh, I wrote this great, it's modern C++, I'm doing it right, look at me, I'm calling find, and then it's slow, right? It's hard to know, am I doing it right? We have some tools to help us. We can benchmark, we can try running it and saying, hmm, 10 minutes seems excessive. But knowing your confidence is accurate or not, it's actually a, a tough problem. Am I doing it right? Is there a keyword or a patio, pattern, or an idiom, or a library that I don't even know is there that would take all this misery away from me and make my code simpler or faster or something. How are you going to know? And it does also kind of depend what your job is. There's a difference between being paid to write code and being paid to design systems. There's a difference between being paid to implement functionality and being paid to design, you know, the API. There's a difference between being a programmer and, and being a mentor or a trainer. But it, for all of us, still the same problem. I think I know enough, but I don't know what I don't know, so maybe I don't know enough. That's a challenge. But we could say, well, I'll try to evaluate if my code is simple. Because I often tell new people, if it's really, really hard and it's fighting you and you're struggling and there's a lot of swearing and it keeps getting more and more and more complicated, you need to take a step back because some initial premise of yours is wrong. There's something wrong with your design. If you had, were coming at this correctly, using the right library, using the right design, you would be able to write simple code. Well, since I'm asking you a lot of rhetorical questions, let's, let's ask that. Is that actually a legitimate thing for me to say? Is it naturally better code? Well, certainly simpler code is more readable code. We talk all the time, we say you should express your intent. People should know what's going on. If you compare using mutable to casting away const, using mutable expresses your intent much more clearly. And it's less characters on the screen. So it's going to be more readable. That's good. Unsurprising code is more maintainable. If you think back to that engine loop, which was full of surprises, <laughs> it was almost impossible to maintain. And that's the brittle stuff. You don't really know what it does. You take one thing away and suddenly it doesn't work anymore or it works but differently, which is worse. So you want your code to be straightforward and obvious and to lead the reader through what you're doing so that when they need to change what you're doing, they know where to change it in the code. That makes sense to me. I like that. What about moving things away, encapsulating things, ideally in code you did not write? Again, if you're not the library writer. Um, wonderful things about moving away to library writers is that they do all the edge cases. So they, they go, well, what if you're assigning to yourself? They go, what if the end is before the beginning? They do all that stuff that people on their first pass don't do. So, the number one benefit to me of moving to an abstraction that someone else wrote is those magic words, someone else wrote. Uh, James and I did a talk at CppCon two, three years ago uh, about making C++ code beautiful. And one of our points was other people's code is beautiful. And I think most people don't support that, right? I mean, hands up if you really think other people's code is beautiful. Like maybe a tenth of you are prepared to say other people's code is beautiful. Of course your own code is beautiful. Of course it is. I haven't even seen it and I know your code is beautiful. But other people's code could also be beautiful. Like just consider that possibility. Especially if that other person has maybe put in about a hundred times more hours on that than you're going to. 
just told yesterday or the day before, but a comment that said, I can't use sort here because, uh, ridiculous premise, something like we did, we're not going to compare on stood less. So here's a quick bubble sort. <laughs> There's like so much wrong here. When you move to a library, the first thing that happens is it's simpler, right? So instead of a comment that says, here's a quick bubble sort, and, and then your bubble sort, you just have the call to sort. So that's simpler because it's shorter. But that's not the only thing it's bringing to the party, right? So calling that library is going to give you pr probably better correctness and probably better performance. But it's not, I'm not just talking about libraries. Your own abstractions can do this too. So when you build a class and then you have a constructor and a destructor, now people can't forget to clean up, can't forget to release the connection or close the file or whatever it is they're supposed to do. And the complexity, in some cases it just moves, but moving 100 lines of complexity into 10 different 10 line complexities can be still simpler because some of them I don't have to pay attention to. And sometimes the complexity actually just goes away. Still don't quite understand this magic, but it's something that I've been brought in to do as a consultant a lot of times. Here's our 15,000 line heartbeat of our thing. Can you make it better? <laughs> sure. And I think I'm going to end up still having 15,000 lines, just you know, better organized or something. So literally, here's a switch statement on line 1,000, and the end br brace is on line 16,000. And then there's some more lines after that of cleaning up. And I think when I'm done, I'll still have that many lines in the file, and then I don't. Like it does sometimes just completely evaporate. And I don't fully know why, but I do know that it's a real thing. So when you march up to complicated code and you try to make it simpler, the simplest thing to do is to hide the complexity, but it actually sometimes just kind of evaporates. After you grasp that other people's code can be beautiful, I have another thing for you to grasp. Optimizers are better than you. I know, I know. How about greater than or equal to? Can we do, are we okay with that? They're definitely better than you if you're not measuring, okay? That's 100% true. And you're probably not measuring, especially when you haven't typed the code yet, right? Uh, people who pre-optimize, who literally have yet to type the code, but who tell me I'm typing it this way because it will be faster, you don't know that, dude. You just do not know that. Um, as a first pass, trust the compiler. Trust the optimizer. If when you profile you genuinely have a problem, then you may need to do something where you trade off simplicity against performance, but don't start there. I am absolutely amazed at what compilers are doing. And it's, it's probably the biggest benefit of the compiler explorer of God bolting, that you can go and see what assembly you get. And you do all this clever nonsense with bit shifts or something, same assembly as when you wrote it the readable way. You unroll the loop yourself because you're so smart, same assembly as when you don't unroll the loop. Because optimizers also have heard of unrolling loops. Go figure. Optimizers are really good. And if you want to see how good, you literally can. You can literally open up Compiler Explorer, plunk in your piece of code, see what assembly you get for it at various levels of optimizer, and say, oh, I can write readable, understandable, simple code. The compiler will turn it into the messy thing that's super fast, but no humans have to look at that. And that is a really good goal. Now, I'm not going to say that 100% of everything you write is like that, but until you've measured it, it is. So start with simple and readable and expressive code. And only get weird when there's a reason and a really good one, not just I intuitively know. I'll just do a quick bubble sort, it'll be fine. <laughs> but let me ask you another hypothetical question. I C++ is complicated. Maybe that's important to you. I mean, let's, let's sit with this question for a minute. How important is it that you're really good it's something that's really complicated. This is a real thing for me. I've been sort of in my last five years or so going around telling people C++ can be simple. 
Modern C++ is readable and expressive and short and fun and use the algorithms library and you don't have to do this all yourself. And there's this little process in the back of my head that says, but if it's easy, anybody can do it. If I'm doing it the easy way, am I the best one in the room anymore? And these are real. But I want to do it the simple way. I want it to be easy. I don't want to be that consultant who has to get called back because no one can read what I wrote and they need to make a change and nobody knows what I did. I want to be the consultant who leaves them with code they're proud to own because they know what it does and they can maintain it themselves. And that's, that's my own selfishness. I don't like doing the same work twice. So it's like, thank you, that was great. I'm going off to another project. I don't want you to call me in a year and tell me that you need to add another case to the switch statement and nobody else can do it. That, to me, is just gross. So I want to leave this wake of readable, simple, beautiful stuff. But do we really all want that? Like maybe for some of us it is actually a point of pride. C++ is the language for smart people. Right? You've all had this. You go to something that's not our tribe. Maybe it's your reunion. Maybe it's a bigger company that has other kinds of programmers in it. Or maybe it's just the friends of, of your romantic partner, and they ask you what you do. You say, oh, I'm a software developer. And they say, oh, cool. I do Ruby, Python, PHP. What do you work in? And you say, C++. And then they say, you must be really smart. <laughs> People say this to me, like, out loud, with their mouths. And I'm a little bit shocked, because I'm a Canadian. We kind of don't do that. And, and it's also really hard to respond to that. You must be really smart. What do you say to that? Do you say, no, really, I'm stupid? <laughs> That's not right. You shouldn't disagree with people when they're complimenting you. Do you say, yes, why? Yes, as a matter of fact, I am. Thank you. Um, so this is really kind of a conversation killer. But it's a real thing. Like, how can I advocate for everybody to draw back the curtains and let some folks through all those doors, come on into the inner chamber, in here, we use the standard library algorithms. In here, we use some operator overload so our code is readable. In here, we explain what we're doing and the code tells the truth and you don't need to have memorized the standard to understand what's happening right here. And if we stop being gatekeepers, are we still the smartest people in the room? Because I want you to embrace that simplicity and write simple code. But it's not easy to say, other people's code can be beautiful. The optimizer can be better than me. I am good at a complicated language. I'm so good that I can make it simple. I'm going to leave you sitting with that kind of emotional thing and get practical for a minute and say, what does it mean if code is simple? Someone asked uh, the other day, what, what is it, how do you know if something's not safe for work? I know it when I see it, right? Simple code is easy to read and to understand, and it is expressive. I don't have to puzzle out what it's trying to do. It tells me what it's doing, and not in a comment, either. Bjarna likes to say, the compiler doesn't read comments, and neither do I. <laughs> usually, shorter code is simpler code. I'm going to give you a counterexample, but usually, Shorter code is simpler code. Idioms can look complicated. Think back to a time of raw pointers and going if, round bracket, p equals some function that returns a pointer, end round bracket, and then inside the braces of the if, you do stuff with that pointer, right? So if the pointer that comes back from the function is a null pointer, we don't go in the if. That's such an idiom for us that as soon as you see it, you know what it's doing. But if you come to that loop as a Ruby or Fortran programmer, you're like, what? First of all, they don't understand the single equal double equal thing. So they think we're testing whether or not P is equal to, wait, a function? What's happening here? And they want to write something like P equals the function if P is not equal to null pointer, right? But we have our idiom. So when you're inside the door and you recognize the idiom, that code's simpler than the long, hard way. But when you're outside the door, it's not simpler. So now we don't have a universal objective rule of simpleness. 
And that's why I said we have to learn our idioms. When you're fluent in the idioms of your language, different code is simple to you than when you're not fluent in the idioms of your language. So imagine you wanted to write a function that figures out whether a number is odd or not. I understand it's not computationally taxing, but it fits on the slide. So one approach would be I would write a function called is odd. It takes an integer and returns true or false. Another approach might be that I would have this uh, out value. I think we can all agree the first one is simpler, right? And not really just because it's shorter either. Think about how you call them. I can call the is odd like this, but in order to call the other guy, I have to first declare my bool and then pass that in as my in out param. So sometimes life is simple. The is odd is simpler than the is odd too. Okay, let's try to implement it. Remember what 5s? I know a lot of people who would write their code like this. We declare our ret val up at the beginning, and uh, let's have lots of things with names. So I'll say remainder equals x mod 2. That way you don't need to recognize the modulo operator because it's called remainder, so it reminds you what it does. And then I see this all the time from people who learned another language first, right? If remainder is greater than zero, ret val equals true, else ret val equals false. I know you all want to go ret val equals remainder is greater than zero, right? Because that's our idiom. And then, of course, the last line, return ret val, we're being structured, we only have one return, that's good. Is it? Is it good? I don't think it's good. Like, it's, it's simple in that it's kind of like speaking baby talk. We're using very simple building blocks, but it's like a lot of lines of code, and then when you're finally done with it, you're like, oh, I get it, you're returning true or false based on whether or not remainder is zero or one. So why don't we just do that? Especially if you, again, know your language. So, oh, I know the ternary operator, or the immediate if, depending on what you want to call it. And I see this, but it's like, well, if the condition is true, return true, otherwise return false. Um, wait, <laughs> you're still not doing it right. How about this? Okay, but again, be that Fortran programmer or that Ruby on Rails programmer or that Java programmer, I guess. This takes an integer, zero or one, but the function returns a bool. And we're like, yeah, well, duh. Everyone knows, everyone knows about promoting ints and uh, the rules about what numerical values map to true and what numerical values map to false. And um, if you're not a multi-language person, you might want to know that they're not always the zero and one that we use, right? Uh, especially in basic, it's opposite. So maybe it would actually be simpler to be longer. Let's be clear that I'm going to take that integer and cast it to a bool. And if someone's reading this code who doesn't know how integers and bools interconvert, they got a thing they can look up now. And they can figure out, oh, okay, zero will be false and one will be true. And let me see now. So I pass in three, the remainder would be one. And one gets cast to true, so that's correct. Okay, and if I pass it, and they can work it out and they'll be happy. So I kind of feel like it's not always about being shorter. Because the shorter version only works if you know about implicit conversions. Of course, we know about implicit conversions because we're the smart people. Everyone who read our code know about implicit conversions? Are they all the smart people? Are you sure? Is it really going to hurt you to make the conversion explicit? Especially in a dinky little function like this. I don't want to hear anyone whining about perf. So imagine that it's your job to write me a guideline. What guidelines would you come up with from walking through is odd? I'm not going to answer it. I want you to, this is another one I want you to sit with, right? Like, how important is it to know the ternary operator, implicit conversions, those sorts of things? You know, I really want to be able to tell you you don't need to know the whole language is fine, just get started. But I keep coming back to actually, I really kind of need you to know the whole language. Sorry. Is shorter always better? Not always. Right? There's something to be said for being expressive, which sometimes means being explicit. But what's expressiveness? Hmm. All right. Let's leave 
what does it mean to be simple as a not quite solved problem and loop back to, well, what's supposed to be simple? What should I make simple? My code, right? My code should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. You don't arbitrarily start taking away functionality because, well, this would be hard to read. You still have to do whatever you came here to do. When you're using some sort of a library, its API should be simple but not to the extent of taking away control because this is C++ and we are all about control. So think about lambdas. Who's used lambdas in any other language? Maybe a quarter of you? All the other languages in which I've used lambdas, it's simpler, but it's also more complicated. Like there's a series of C-sharp interview questions that really revolve around understanding that all the captures are by reference. So that if you, if you put a lambda in a variable and you capture something and then you change the value of what you captured and put a different lambda that captures the same thing in a different variable, blah, blah, and then you invoke all the lambdas, they all use the most recent value of whatever it was you captured because they all capture by reference. We can capture by reference, but we can also capture by value or by moving, or with an alias, or generically, like it goes on for a while, but that's important to us, right? Because we want control. So if you're designing an API, I don't want you to design an API that's at the don't worry your pretty little head about that level, that doesn't give me any control. So you're, you're also at as simple as possible, but no simpler. You have to still give people the control that they need. But what about the insides of those libraries? Right? I mean, is it turtles all the way down? Does it have to be simple all the way down? Should I say I'm not prepared to use the standard library because parts of the standard library, have you read that code? My goodness, it's complicated. No. That's where it can be complicated. Go ahead. That's what we say now about new and delete. Right? If you're typing new and delete, you're doing it wrong unless you're a library implementer. Then you're allowed to type new and delete. That's where all the crufty stuff can go. And the rest of us get the simple stuff. So don't expect that you have to push that simplicity all the way down. So let me give you an example of simple rules to make your code simpler. Because I'm really here to talk about the guidelines, you know, as you can tell. Um, so a simple rule might be don't do such a thing. Don't do that. That thing over there, don't do it. Or uh, use a library whenever you can. When you have a choice of two ways to do something, do whatever is simpler. These rules are simple. They're only a few words long. They're just not very useful because they're vague. It's like saying if something is long or large or small. I don't know. Let's make slightly more complicated rules. Here's a style to write in. I don't mean snake case and camel case, but like your function should be short. Your function should have good names. Your variable should have long names. But again, like what's short? What's long? I, I worked <laughs> in Fortran on one of my work terms. And my, she wasn't my boss, but she was in charge of my code. And she had these rules for our Fortran. We had to declare all the variables at the top. We had to have a block of comments at the top that said what all the local variables were and what they meant. So like I is a counter for the loop, that kind of thing. It's brilliant. Like you wouldn't have been able to understand the code without it. And then you were allowed to have the code. And all of this, the declarations, the comments, and your actual code, 60 lines, hard limit. Not allowed to be 61. Because that's readability, man. And so you would have a function called calc1. And it called calc2 and calc3, right? And, and, they, and they would have their like 10 lines of comments and 10 lines of variables and 30 to 40 lines of actual code so that we would fit in her rules for 60 lines of code per function and would actually get our calculation done. It was so awful. So if I'm going to write this rule and tell you you should have short functions, I can't tell you only 60 lines, because then when you have 61 lines of work to do, you're going to split it into two functions. That's almost certainly wrong, especially if it's like, here's the top half, 
And here's the bottom half. It's, it's not bad if you can actually give things real names. If you say, I'm going to open the file and loop through it, and then for each record I'm going to, hmm, we'll make a function to do the hmm, that's fine. It's all readable. It's good. But when you have calc 1, calc 2, calc 3, it's not good. I could tell you, use the conventions the people around you are using. So in the standard library, in algorithm, we have accumulate. I know it's more letters than sum or combine, but if you call your thing accumulate, a bunch of people will immediately know what it does because they will have a neuron that triggers over to that thing from algorithm. The same with if you call your function put in correct order, it's more work than if you call your function sort. This is C++. We have operator overloading. I do not want to see a member function plus. I do not want to see a member function equals or is equal. Right? That's not what we do. In that case, it's shorter to type plus than plus. But the reason you do it isn't because it's shorter. It's because it's what people are expecting. Whenever you can, you need to leverage existing abstractions. These are not bad rules, but you can see that if they weren't trying to fit them on a slide, they would get long and complicated very quickly. You know, what does it mean to say your function is short? What's a good name? What conventions should I follow? What abstractions are out there I should be using? I'm going to suddenly be filling many, many, many pages, right? So speaking of long and complicated, I did say <laughs> I was here to talk about the guidelines. <laughs> Um, I asked this at CppCon in my talk when I had guidelines in the title of my talk, and I had to say, not counting the title of this talk. But let me ask again. How many of you have already heard of the C++ core guidelines? We're getting better. That's over half, I would say. It's been over two years since they were announced. So in that two years, let me ask, how many of you have gone, once is enough, to github.com slash ISO CPP and looked at them? It's pretty much the same number of people who claim they had heard of them, which is interesting. But how many of you have done something in your code or had a conversation with another person drawing on a guideline? You appear to have the USA beat, I will tell you that, but it's still less than a quarter of the room. There's over 500 guidelines. One of them could have helped you by now. I don't know what you've been doing in those last two years, but I swear you've at some point had a decision to make, and one of these guidelines would have helped you. But I think I know why one of these guidelines hasn't helped you. I didn't choose this at random, but here is a guideline, F16. If you haven't been there, by the way, they're, they're split up into sections, F for functions, C for classes, E for expressions, and so on. And then they're numbered within that, and there's tons of great links, you can bop around in your browser and understand them. So F16 says, for in parameters, pass cheaply, typed, cheaply copied types by value and others by reference to const. By the way, the guidelines always goes around saying reference to const instead of const reference because of this whole const before, const after. Uh, and I, my heart is const before, but my head is const after. Okay. Um, and one of the ways to be better at being const after and to override my heart is to say things like reference to const instead of const reference. So that's, that's what's happening there. But anyway, if we just read the title, never mind all the rest of the words here, um, what's a cheaply copied type? That sounds like a whole other big argument. Well, don't worry, we have a whole paragraph here explaining what's cheap to copy. And then we have uh, exceptions. If the function is going to unconditionally move from the argument, uh, you should use an R value. If the function is going to keep a copy, then you should do this. And then we have other special cases. Maybe go do some perfect forwarding. We have a link to another guideline. Like This is not a simple guideline. If you catch me in the elevator, and you're like, I'm designing an API, and I've got a bunch of parameters that I have to pass in, uh, and I don't know now, do I take them by ref? Do I take them by value? What should I do? I'm not going to just yabber this at you in the elevator, right? This is a long conversation. And for you to read through this and figure out, there's, there's charts and tables underneath that goes on for some time. But it's not a simple guideline because figuring out how to put parameters down to a function is actually, it's not trivial. It's an important 
thing that has trade-offs. Like there's a ton of readability advantages in just passing everything by value, and sometimes that's really fast, but sometimes it's not. And again, the compiler and the optimizer are better than you, so a lot of this taking by value is not as awful as you think it is, but sometimes it is, and, and I can't just tell you always pass by value, and I also can't just tell you always pass by reference. So, we're not really here to discuss that. We're here to discuss why guidelines are complicated or simple. I mean, I'm pro-simplicity. I tell you to set your ego aside, embrace the simple, embrace the easy, welcome the newcomers, open up some of those doors to the inner courtyard, and then that's our guidelines? Like, shouldn't our guidelines be simple? Our code's supposed to be short. Our code's supposed to leverage extractions. Our code's supposed to be expressive. Then we write guidelines that are none of those things. Is that maybe why everyone's ignoring the guidelines? Because they're not, they're not readable? They're not simple? I want you to read the guidelines. So should I be campaigning to make the guidelines simpler so you can all start following them? In my opinion, the answer to all of these questions is no. So I'm going to put up a straw man, straw woman, straw horse, and knock it down. The thing about enemies of straw is that they're really easy to knock down. But this particular enemy of straw has been put forward by other people before, so it makes a pretty good example. I'm sure some of you have worked with people who say, never use exceptions. Now, as guidelines go, this is delightfully simple. It is three words long. Two of them are regular words. Only one of them is a language jargon keyword. So it's easy to understand, and it's easy to test. OK, it's simple. Now, if you're writing a game, if frame rate is everything, and you can't wait to be correct. Right? It's better to have a little visual glitch and move on than to stutter and freeze the whole thing, because I need to figure out exactly what this pixel is. But not everything in life is a game that's governed by frame rate. And in a lot of things, correctness is super important. And in the world we're writing for, things do go wrong. You go to open a file, you don't have permission. You go to read something from the database, but the connection has been lost. Things happen. I, I don't care about this out of memory, stuff like that. that. That's not real. But things happen. So in the don't use exceptions world, we return false. We check for everything in advance. If there's trouble, we return false. We don't throw an exception. OK, this seems logical. It's kind of seductive. We'll just return false. Nothing to it. Whenever my children ever said the word just in any context, I would be like, there is no just. Anytime a sentence has the word just in it, it's almost certainly wrong. We'll just return false. Well, you might, if you're old enough to have some history, you might say, why do we even have exceptions? Because constructors don't have return values. So if something goes wrong in a constructor, you can't return false. That's OK. We won't do anything in the constructor. Problem solved. And I've been to talks where people tell you how evil exceptions are, and they absolutely say you can't do any real work in your constructor. You have some like mem set. That's it, some super easy thing that can't, can't fail. And then you write a function, let's call it init, which can return false, and all the work happens in init. OK, that can work. But what if I forget to call init? Ah, we'll add a member variable that the constructor will set it to false, right? And when init works, it can set it to true. And all my other member functions start with if I'm not initialized, return false. Then they do their stuff. <sighs> or maybe they'll be very helpful and if I'm not initialized, call init. Maybe they'll do that. OK, well, first of all, now I lost my real return value, right? None of my functions can return the answer of whatever I'm supposed to calculate because they're all busy returning true or false. So I've got out params or I'm returning tuples or pairs or something, so life got more complicated. But then also, what if whoever called update or save or what have you didn't check the return value. 
oh, that's no problem. We'll just change the language, and you know this is happening, to say you got to look at the return value from this function. We'll put it, like the attribute on it. <sighs> One way or the other, you either have to say, I don't mind if people look, forget the return value of this function, or I do mind, but you can get around it. So here I'm calling foo, I'm putting the answer into success, and then I never look at success. Right? So I, didn't, I didn't discard the return value, exactly. Now, yes, some co compilers will then say, hey, unused member variable or local variable, you put a value in it and then you never looked at it, but I could still, still not really check it. And so then you're doing code reviews, where I have to make sure that when you checked in that new function, did you correctly make sure we were initialized? Did you uh, correctly check that all the things you called worked? And the... Uh, dependencies on tools to do that for you and on humans to do that for you and the intake time to turn people into your kind of programmer keeps increasing, right? Your code gets longer. You kind of might end up in my engine main loop where all your error checking and ifing is completely obscuring the true language of what you're trying to achieve. Your mainline logic is gone. It's also as a human who's checking things it's very hard to spot when something is missing. So if you include something that's wrong, I can be like, ha, that's wrong. But if you forgot something, I might not see that you forgot it. So you start to rely on tools. So you can see that this very, very simple guideline is producing a lot of complexity in the code that people have to write and in the process of software development about how do we ship and commit and and all of that. Oh, plus, it's <laughs> one other little tiny, tiny thing. Yeah, you can't use the standard library. All right, because some of that stuff throws, right? I mean, you, you push back on that vector, it's going to be reallocating. If we're out of memory, that's a throw right there, because that happens like all the time. Uh, so now you can't have string, and you can't have vector, and you can't have algorithm. You can feel free to write that stuff yourself. I'm sure it won't take five minutes or anyone else's library, if that library might throw. So you're writing a ton of code. Now, it's easy to think that this is ironic and a paradox, and that it's something particular to exceptions. But it is a law of nature. And to prove it, I want to talk to you about blood. Back in when I was learning C++, the multiple partial differential equations I was trying to solve were related to this. This is called the coagulation cascade. Our blood is an amazing substance. It's got blood cells in it, as you probably know, right, red blood cells, white blood cells, something called platelets, but it also has dozens of reactive proteins, which we call enzymes. And these enzymes react to clot when you hurt yourself or if I uh, just let my blood drip, say, into a glass slide. At the very bottom here, uh, bottom right, it says cross-linked fibrin clot. Fibrin, uh, doctors are terrible at naming things. Fibrin is fibrous, so they called it fibrin, meaning that fiber stuff, okay? Um, the cross-linked fibrin clot is like a, a fishing net made of strings and it's holding a bunch of uh, blood cells and things in it, and that makes that sort of jelly globby thing that's a clot of blood. And uh, the cross-linked fibrin clot happens when fibrin, go up that bottom arrow, is uh, in contact with activated factor 13. Where did the fibrin come from? Well, it came from fibrinogen. I told you doctors are just as bad as C++ people at naming things. Fibrinogen generates fibrin. Okay, it's really hard. Um, fibrinogen in the presence of thrombin, thromb being Latin for clot, so clotty stuff, uh, fibrinogen produces fibrin, which produces the cross-linked clot. Well, where did the thrombin come from? That's also known as activated factor two. It came from, and I'm not making this up, the prothrombin, which meets activated factor 10 or activated factor five. And I'm gonna go up the, the path, uh, I'm not gonna be left and right, the contact activation, intrinsic pathway because that was my pathway. So the factor, activated factor 10 that 
gets the prothrombin to become thrombin, which makes the fibrinogen fibrinogen, blah, 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 came because it activated some factor 10 by meeting some factor 9, which came because some activated, some 9 got activated by meeting some 11 activated, which came because some 11 met some activated 12 and so on. And the cool thing about this cascade is that a very, very tiny little bit of surface interaction turns your 12 into activated 12 in an amplified way. And then the activated 12 reacts with a large amount of otherwise stable 11 to make a large amount of activated 11 and so on. And so there's a multiplication factor that produces from a microscopic exposure a clot that you can actually see visibly. You know, that's like a centimeter by a centimeter or something. This is very cool. Plus, if the contrast is good enough, you may be able to see that some of the arrows go backwards. Some of the reactions, they take time, but they actually produce stuff that dissolves fibrin. So that in the normal course of events, the actual kicking off of a blood clot also kicks off the cleanup of that blood clot, a time delayed factor. This is an insanely simplified version of reality. Reality is way more complicated than this. But the reason I want you to know how complicated it is this. Your blood is this complicated chemically. It is also a non-Newtonian fluid. A Newtonian fluid reacts to pressure in a predictable way following well-known rules, but there are fluids like, for example, slurries of, of ice and water, of fish in water, and various other things that do not follow those rules of motion, and blood is, is in that category. So it's a non-Newtonian fluid. It's being pumped not in a steady pressure the way that an industrial pump does, but our hearts are doing this. Our hearts arbitrarily get faster and slower for their own reasons, some of which are chemical and some of which are not. It's being pumped through a vessel whose walls are elastic, and so they change size, not only in response to the pumping, but also like if you get upset, your blood vessels will narrow. If you are hurt, the other branch of the pathway, the extrinsic fact pathway, uh, includes stuff leaking from your, your tissues, your meat, into blood vessels because you're hurt. Blood vessels will also constrict. The surface of these blood vessels is studded with reactants, and sometimes the pipe itself, the walls, open up and let different reactants in from your tissues. So it's insanely complicated. It's starting to make C++ look easy, right? <laughs> but when your insanely complicated blood meets your insanely complicated surface of your blood vessels, do you know what happens? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Your blood just flows. Nobody reacts with anybody. No cascades kick off and no fibrin forms. When you take a glass slide, which is made of one thing, glass, silicon, right? and you put a drop of blood on it, poof, all this happens, and the blood clots solid. Very complicated response, really hard to monitor. If you're a doctor and you're trying to give somebody an artificial something, and you put plastic or some other simple substance into a person, the body puts clots all over it. And people have to be treated with things to stop them from creating clots and dying of strokes. And 20 and 30 years ago, when I was doing my graduate work, they were like, it's a paradox. This really complicated blood system meets our really simple materials, and an incredibly complicated thing happens. And what we want to have happen is the really simple nothing that happens in our lives. And it turns out that the general rule is that when a complex system meets a simple system, you will get a complex interaction. Let me give you some shorter examples. Imagine teaching someone to drive. Think about what you have to learn in order to drive. How fast do I go? Uh, well, the speed limit. How about that? Oh, I'm driving 50. There's a car in front of me driving 40. Do I just drive into the back of it? Because I'm supposed to be driving 50. No, 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 there's an exception. Okay, so if there's a car in front of you, you have to slow down and not hit the car in front of you. Okay. Um, stay in your lane. Okay, that's fine. Oh, my lane ended. <laughs> oh, yes, well, sometimes you have to go in the other lane. No, no, not like that. You're supposed to look first and see if there's a car. And also we have signals. Like teaching someone to drive is not 
a simple rule, a simple guideline. It's incredibly complicated. And yet, when you give someone the non-simple guidelines for how to drive, and you put them out into the real world of traffic, something really simple happens, which is they don't have a car accident. And you don't have all that complication that follows on about having to call tow trucks and report it to the police and so forth and so on. If you think about having some rules for how do we build houses so that they don't fall down on people and when a fire starts it doesn't spread from house to house, building codes are this thick. Any time you take a system and you want to put it in a complex environment with the real world of driving, the real world of people living in houses, or the real world of whatever your software is supposed to do, you have to have complicated rules in order to get the simple interaction. Now, it's not as simple as just make complicated rules and ta-da, simple results. <laughs> they have to be tuned to each other. But my position is you cannot produce simple rules for writing simple code any more than you can expect that your blood will react simply when you drop it onto glass or that you can tell your child who's just got their learner's permit, just drive the speed limit and stay in your lane. It'll be fine. They have to be complicated. So a, an overly simple guideline would be don't use exceptions. Don't use templates. Man, code bloat, it's terrible. Whatever you knew, you must delete. I used to teach this guideline all the time, right? That's n it's simple, like it's six words long, but is it simple for people to live by that guideline? Like not at all, right? Don't use raw pointers, also wrong. Don't use the standard library. When you follow these overly simple rules, you end up with very complicated behavior. You end up with the code that the person has to write in order to follow the guideline being much more complicated than it otherwise would be and or not even working. I think the new and delete is a great example of like for all that trouble and misery that they went through, they still would all have memory links. So do you just like, mm, yeah, okay. Use exceptions when they help your application to be simple and correct and otherwise no. Use templates. When, like, is this, are these good? Is this helping anyone? <sighs> so I can't give up. Can't just say, go ahead, try to write good code. You have to write real guidelines. And real guidelines are complicated. But they're worth it because they are still a distillation of the true complexity that somebody who isn't you went through to get to the guideline. Here's F6 about no accept. Uh, I mean, I'm mad at word four, okay? I don't know what it means to say may not throw. Like literally from the English language point of view, I don't know if it means if your function might not throw or if your function must not throw. I don't know which kind of may that is. But anyway, if your function may not throw, declare it no accept. If you go to the real guidelines and you find F6, you'll see things labeled reason and note and example. And I just pulled them out without their headings so I didn't think the headings were helping. Um, it, it says, you know, if, if you're not supposed to throw an exception, then say that you're not supposed to throw an exception and then uh, you'll be terminated. And this will be uh, faster than treating you as someone who might throw an exception when you're in fact not going to. So the motivation behind no accept is uh, faster, blowing up, which honestly, I don't care. We're blowing up. Take your time. It's fine. <laughs> but the second last sentence also says, declaring a function no accept helps optimizers by reducing the number of alternate execution paths. Right? And there is some setup and teardown in terms of, of preparing for stack unwinding that you don't need to do if it's like if anything goes wrong, we are just exiting. So that's the motivation behind no accept, and it's already kind of buried in here. But then they start in bravely telling you um, sentences that start with action verbs. Put no accept on every function. Like, okay, here we go. I know what to do. I can type my code now. Uh, written completely in C. Um, what? Or, uh, or in any other language without exceptions. And the first time I read this, I'm like, with any other language, no exceptions. And I'm like, no, no, no. They mean any other language that doesn't have exceptions in it. Okay, I'm good. Um, and then just as a bonus, they tell you that the standard library does that. Uh, so that's good. I like copying them. And then we have an uh, information-free sentence, which is basically being const expert doesn't matter. Like just because you're const expert might still throw at runtime, so you might still want to say no accept or not. 
It's like, okay, but why did you even tell me that? So then they move on and they say, the number one misconception really about no accept is that it means your function doesn't throw exceptions. It's not true. It means I don't care if I throw exceptions, no one's going to catch it. Don't set up to catch it. And the thing with, with talking about, oh, vector pushback out of memory, if we are out of memory, like I can't get one byte for whatever string I'm reading from this stream, what am I going to do in my catch block? Am I going to open a file and write to it to log my error? Really? When I have no memory? How's that going to happen? I'm going to put up a dialog box on the screen. I'm sure that'll work fantastic when we are, remember, out of memory. If you ask for a million bytes and get told no, I understand you can catch that, and we can have a conversation. You can do something about it. But if you're reading little six-character strings from a stream, and you've read so many of them that you are out of memory, it is an illusion to think that you're going to handle that exception. You are not. You can write code to try to handle the exception. I'm just saying that code's not really going to achieve it. So you can say, you know what, if this, if this throws, I don't even care. We're done. And you mark no accept, even though it might throw. That's a really interesting piece of insight. Thank you, guideline writers. But they're not done. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I'm not even, OK? Please feel free to read the guideline. It turns out getting no accept right is hard. If you do it too much, your, accept, your app will throw some sort of exception and terminate instead of catching it, handling it, recovering it, logging it, asking the user stuff, whatever you normally do when you catch exceptions. That's kind of bad. If you underuse it, you are giving away some optimizations. And the ability for certain people to know certain things by reading your header files. Those feel like I could afford to give those up compared to crashing. So most people will err on the side of underusing because it feels safer. So in fact, that guideline is trying to get you to use it more. I know it didn't feel like that, but it's saying like, this is what it's for, and this is when you can use it, and this is when it'll be good. And when to use no accept correctly is a non-trivial conversation. You can't just say put it on everything. And, and especially not put it on everything and let the compiler sort it out because we don't have checked exceptions, so the compiler isn't going to sort it out, right? So there's a long and complicated guideline to walk you through that process. And it's easy to mock it and say, man, that's really hard to read, because it is. But there is also some really useful wisdom in there. Here's one that people resist for a different reason. You know, there's really no difference between class and struct, right? Just the default visibility, and you shouldn't be relying on default visibilities. So most of you probably have a guideline for when to use class and when to use struct. Anyone got this? No? No hands? I'm not surprised. I didn't have one hand, just to be difficult. I'm like, wait, what? If the class has an, in an invariant, what? And then, it, OK, it's actually it's not wrong. It's actually a pretty good point. This reason is insane. It's like readability. Uh, what? Ease of comprehension. No, I'm not comprehending. What? Um, it's the, the use of class alerts the programmer that there is an invariant. So an invariant is something that's always true once you're successfully constructed, typically. So say I have a bank account, and the bank account has a log of transactions, and it has a balance. The balance at all times is equal to the sum of all the transactions. That's the invariant. So when I first create it, I have to create an empty log with no transactions in it, and I have to set the balance to zero. When somebody deposits $100, I increase the balance, I add the transaction to the log. When somebody withdraws $50, I decrease the balance, I add the transaction. It'd be very bad to have the ability to edit or remove transactions, but if I had them, they would have to adjust the balance. So we're maintaining the invariant. Compare that to like a point x, y. There's no rule that says x and y have the following relationships to each other. You can change x, you can change y, it doesn't make any difference. If you keep a date as the number of ticks since the dawn of time, which is January 1st, 1970, I was born before the dawn of time myself, then you can change those ticks any time. But if you keep your date as a month, 
and a day and a year, you can't change them independently. Like if it's February 29th, 2012, and then you change the year to 2013, it's no longer a valid date. If it's January 30th, 2012, and you change the month to February, so it's February 30th, 2012, no longer a valid date. So that that date class has an invariant that the tick since the dawn of time one didn't. So that's kind of like, huh. They then explain what an invariant is. And I'm like, you know, that's actually pretty neat. I get that. Like, obviously, the minute you have an invariant, you have to have uh, encapsulation. I can't let someone reach into the bank account and just change the balance to 150 because they, they're not going to do the right things to the transaction log. So I have to have encapsulation. I have to make the balance private, and then I have to uh, expose public functions that people will come in, and I'll keep everything right. Whereas with the struct, not so much. It's like, oh, you know what? I, I, I like this rule now. But I had to think about it for a while. But now you know what I don't like about it? Say, I, OK, I'm going to take this on board. I'm going to live this life. And now tomorrow I'm writing some, fo some new extension to something I've got. I'm like, I'm going to need a thing here, a class. And I go to type class whatever, and I get into CL, and I'm like, or should it be a struct? Am I going to have an invariant in this? And I don't know about the rest of you, but when I'm like, OK, we need to add a new report to the whatever, whatever, uh, the should we have an invariant here doesn't come up very often. And it probably should. So I don't like this guideline on first reading because it's like opaque, what's an invariant, I'm not thinking that way, stop it, I just wanted to type code. What's this crap about designing and thinking and architecting? I'm here to type code. Can't you see I'm in a code editor? What part of typing code isn't clear? And the guideline is like, how about you think before you type? And then I'm a toddler and I'm like, well, I don't want to. I came here to type. Turns out, it's actually a pretty darn good guideline because thinking is probably the right thing to do. Here's a guideline that I had some fun with in my CPPCon talk because I, I don't agree with as written. So I'm going to present it to you the way I do it. It's just a matter of order. We all agree multiple out values is bad. Okay. So you can only return one thing from a function, but that is not the same as saying you can only return one value from a function. The guideline as written says prefer a tuple or a struct. I prefer a struct first. That's my first choice. Return something with a good name and where the members of it have good names. For the particular case where it's an object and the Boolean indicating whether things are good or not, in other words, whether the object is usable or not, you don't have to write your own struct for that. You can use optional if you're C++ 17, which is fantastic. And let's face it, there's always the time when what you would call that struct is two strings and three ints, three ints and a string. Uh, go ahead, you can use a tuple. Um, I find especially that I, I tend to use tuples as a way station. So the f I write the function and it returns an int. And then life changes, people do things, and I realize I actually need to calculate I don't know, an error message as well. So then I'm like, OK, so it returns a pair of int and string. OK. And then life changes, and people do things, and now it needs to return a Boolean as well. I'm like, fine, tuple, int string, bool, we're fine. We'll just move along. Eventually, again, I take my hands off my hips. I'm like, OK, I'm going to be an adult. And I come up with a struct that has a real name, like it's an employee or a purchase order or something. And then it has the integer and the string and the Boolean as properly named member variables. But this is, again, about thinking. Like, don't just stick more out params on the end of your function. As you have the world change and have your requirements change, and now my function needs to return two values, changing your return type and then trying to come up with a name for that return type, even if it is for now two ints and a string, it's about thinking before you type your code. So not just out params suck. But also, designing isn't bad. Yes, it also makes your code simpler. Yes, it also makes your code more, more readable. We had the isbool example with the out param, and we all agreed it was simpler not to have the out param. But the cost of not having the out param is more thinking. And I'm, I'm going to come down pro thinking. So let's 
revisit the idea of simplicity. It cannot be simple everywhere. Our libraries don't have to be simple inside. Our guidelines don't have to be simple because the problems we're trying to solve, the environment that our programs are recreating is complicated. You know, we're trying to model the stock market or the weather. We're trying to keep nuclear reactor from blowing up. We're trying to, to get the robot to drive around Mars properly. Some of us maybe are implementing tic-tac-toe. It's pretty simple domain space but most of us are working on stuff that's complicated. And so our programs are, given half a chance, they're going to get super complicated. And what we can hope for is to move that complication into libraries, into abstractions, into places where it doesn't obscure what's going on. And we will therefore naturally have to use complicated guidelines. Complicated guidelines can be good if they produce simple code. Simple guidelines are bad when they produce complicated code. And it may feel more fun when you're learning guidelines to learn the simple ones until you're in your office trying to use them and sweating and, and, and just having a really hard time because following that simple guideline isn't so simple. The complicated guidelines actually end up with the simpler code. And some of the complicated guidelines their complexity is in your head because they say it depends on a thing you didn't think about yet. And then you know what your job is, you have to think about that now. And you probably didn't want to. But I'm gonna say that it's a feature of the guideline that is making you think about that now. Like unique pointer versus shared pointer. When it was just a raw pointer, we just said stuff star and we were done. We just nude it up and we were done. Now when you're gonna use a smart pointer, you have to stop and say, is this a good case for shared pointer? Spoiler, probably not. But you have to think about it right then, instead of just saying stuff star equals new stuff. But again, that's a feature. Simplicity is not just for beginners. To really write simple code, you need to know so much. You need to know the language. You need to know the whole language. You need to know the patterns and the idioms that we use. You need to know the libraries. You know, Sean's implementation of things where he says, this is obviously a rotate and all I need to do is a partition followed by a blah blah. He ends up with like really simple code because he knows the algorithms. That's not, again, a paradox or an oddity. That's actually the secret sauce. You need to know what can go wrong. You need to know what might change in the future. We're not talking about, for simplicity, I am omitting the error checking in this example. That's not what I'm talking about at all, right? You need to know what might go wrong and write simple code that works under those circumstances. Writing simple code is a gift to whoever comes after you, which is almost certainly you. <laughs> when you read something and you understand it, like take a minute and say thank you to yourself if necessary for doing it that way. It's not just, I'll write a quick bubble sort. It's about taking the time to understand the problem, using the patterns and idioms that you have, and then doing a complete job in a way that other people can understand. Uh, I mentioned for simplicity, error checking has been omitted. My other favorite is for simplicity, we'll just call the vector v and this function f. That's not simplicity, right? It's very easy for the person who's writing the example and it's very hard for everybody else. So true simplicity would be your vector had a good name, and your function had a good name, you included the tests, you included the error handling, and it still was simple and readable and expressive. So, I've been talking for almost two hours. What do I want you to do? I want you to learn. I'm sorry. I would love to be able to say, you came to a conference or you loaded up a session on YouTube. You're good, you're done, thank you. You have, you have completed C++. <sighs> You need to know your language, all your language, even the parts from 1993. 
You need to know your libraries. You need to know the patterns and the idioms and the names for things that we use. Like uh, immediately invoked initializing lambda expression is actually super cool. You know why? It lets you make something const. So if you have something that's really hard to initialize, the only way to initialize it is like do a loop or something that slowly accumulates it. You're like, I can't make it const. But if you write a lambda that does that, and then say the variable const equals the lambda, you can have all your loop and all your weirdness, and then the variable's const for the rest of the function. It's like, wow, I get to be const correct. I just have to learn this idiom about lambdas. So it's hard to keep learning new idioms, but there's big benefit to it. And I want you, this is actually technically a talk about the guidelines. I know it doesn't maybe feel like it. Um, I want you to use the guidelines. I really do. Like every time you have a design decision to make, I want you to go see if there's a guideline about it because there's like 500 of them, so there probably is. Except that they're complicated. They are. Somebody thought about something for like five years. And then, I'm sorry, instead of writing three words, they wrote a page. It's still quicker than five years. Read the page. And when they make you do some design, do some thinking, it depends on something you hadn't thought about yet, treat that as a feature and think about that. I want you to value simplicity. I want you to understand that simplicity is more than just having less code. I want you to imagine the person who needs to read this code later, especially if they're new to your company and new to this language. Could they understand it? Would they know what it's doing? Because, you know, we are not here to show off. It's great that you know all the idioms and all the initials, but this isn't about showing how smart you are. It's about making it for the person after you. And finally, I know I said it, but I'll say it again. You really never can stop learning. And with that, I'm ready for some questions. Thank you. Less of a question and more of a sales pitch. <laughs> uh, a good way to learn the core guidelines is to use CPP core check or other static analysis tools that implement the guidelines for you. Um, I agree with that. Using checkers, uh, once you're kind of in the guideline camp, don't go yourself by hand through, your, through existing code to see if it meets the guidelines or not, but try running existing code through a checker. And, and then read whatever guidelines it tells you you're violating and, and understand them, and that is one way to, to explore them based on what you're not doing right today. Yes, good point. Hi, Volker from ThinkCell. Uh, th first, thank you very much for your talk. I liked it very much. Um, I have one objection, though. <laughs> you were suggesting that under certain circumstances, it could be helpful and add simplicity to add redundancy. Syntactic redundancy. Um, explicitness you? rather than, let's say, redundancy. Yes. Well, sure. And I understand what you're saying. It's a balance. I don't want to say if blah return true, else return false, which is like explicit, but I don't want to do that. I think let it, let I, me make the argument. Sure. Um, just one, one more sentence. Um, when you explicitly say add um, a, a cast operator where the language doesn't require one, right. then you make people who actually know the language think about why did she add it there? Why, why, yeah, what's that's the meaning? Did I, did I miss something? And that may actually make the, key, uh, the, the code less readable. I just want to make that um, So you're right, it's a trade-off, right? If we all know all the idioms and we all know the language fully, then we can write more idiomatically and we can rely on implicit conversions and not have to explain what we're doing. But if our imagined audience has a lesser knowledge, then we want to signpost and flag things and say, hey, look here, this is a conversion. I actually think in implicit conversions, between ints and bools, I'm happy to flag all the time, and I'm okay if an experienced person says, what is she doing? I already knew that was happening. I'll take it. Because I do find that's the most surprising thing to non-C++ people who come into our language, as opposed to like int, int to double or something, which is... Yeah, a similar example is putting brackets uh, because you're not sure about operator precedence. Yes. Uh, that also, if you do that redundantly, it may look wrong to experienced people. Um, I have one more thing I want to ask since the line is not very long. 
Um, and that's really an open question. We have a very strict idea about the following question at ThinkCell, and I would like to know what you think about it. Um, when you follow the la guideline to write simple functions, short functions, name everything that could be a function, um, you end up with a couple of instances where you have a function that is only called once. Yes. And we have a very strong idea that, oh, well, I'm spoiling it here, sorry. But <laughs> our idea is that whenever you call a function once, that's a very strong hint you should probably inline it, because then you see the context and you have more op no, options for optimization. And uh, sometimes hiding, the idea of hiding it away in a named function may actually be counterproductive and may cover things up rather than making it simple. So if you write a function that's 10 lines long, and then I come along and I say, wow, 10, that's pretty long. I'll tell you what we should do. We should split this into 10 functions that are each one line long. I'm not helping you, right? Um, there, there is a limit to how short a function is OK, and especially if it's never called anywhere else again. Um, there are people who want to refactor as long as they can continue to come up with a name. And so they would literally like have a function called increment that, that increments something. And I'm not one of those people. Um, but I also actually don't really care whether the function is called more than once. That doesn't fit, fit into my logic. If you have a function that's 10 lines long, I'm probably just going to let it be a function that's 10 lines long. If you have a function 100 lines long, I'm looking at its structure. And usually, I just ask the human, I'm like, what does this do? And they say, well, first we get set up, and then we loop through all the whatevers, and for each one, we something. And I'm like, OK, so we're going to have a function called setup, and we're going to have a function called something. But I keep the structure. Like, I don't try to hide the loop. I don't make a function called loop through all the whatevers that is just a for loop that calls the something. It's OK for me if the function shows its bones, shows how it works. But uh, once something gets to be 15,000 lines long, nobody understands it. And Thank you very much. Yeah. Don't worry about 10. You're good. Hi. Thank you for this uh, great talk. Uh, you say that uh, it's OK that we have complex guidelines because they help us create simple code. But uh, I think that we should have different sets of guidelines for beginners and for advanced people. Because uh, if you take your example about uh, teaching how to drive a car and uh, we take a uh, newbie and tell him, well, you should uh, keep your lane, but uh, sometimes you should change your lane, and then you should uh, show that you are going to change it, and so on. Uh, he or she is not ready to understand this complex guideline. So for beginner, we should have short and simple guideline, but uh, so that they are able to understand and, and start. So I, I, do, I do agree with you in principle. So I have now successfully taught two humans to drive. And we started not on a street. We started in a parking lot. And unlike a, a lot of North Americans, uh, I drive standard and I taught my children to drive standard. So we really focused on like making the car move forward. There was nothing about signals and lanes and how fast you go. We had a bunch of lessons on how to successfully let the clutch out. Right? And there was no other cars, and there was no other traffic, and there was no lanes, and there was no stop signs and traffic lights. If, but if you try to do this with, with uh, programming, when my children were in the parking lot, they weren't doing anything. right? We weren't going to the store to get milk. We were just in a parking lot working on driving. And they're like, OK, that's enough lessons. I'm going to drive. And so is there a subset of core guidelines that you could give to a newbie where they could actually be a programmer? They could actually go to the store for milk? That's the problem. I don't think there is. You're right that some of them are way too complicated for beginners. But I can't tell beginners, don't worry about it. Just always use class. I'll teach you about class versus struct later. That's actually unfair, right? Because they actually, one thing, nobody ever reads part two. So they're never going to come along and read those ones. So I agree with you. I have all these same emotional things. The guidelines are too complicated. It's not fair. How can beginners possibly blah, blah? but I can't actually find a way to make it work to give them a simpler set of guidelines. Because we do have to go to the store and get milk. OK, thank you. Hi, hi Kate. Hi. Uh, two, two remarks or questions. Uh, first one, on my company, what we do 
is uh, divide our guidelines in a few sections. First, there's the title, then there is the explanation of what you should do, then there is a rationale for why you should do this, and finally, the exceptions, if any. I, I don't know if you think that's a good way to present a guideline. I do, I do in theory. Um, but what I've seen in the core guidelines, they have these sections like, here's the rule, here's the reason, here's the example. But what's in the thing labeled reason isn't always a reason. Or, or else it's like that invariant thing where it says, well, readability. <laughs> like, when I first read it, I'm like, how is, how's that readability? Like, what? So I think a lot of things make sense to the person who's writing them. They don't always make that same sense to the person who's reading them. Yeah, uh, m my fear was also that since it's irrational, people may skip, oh, that's for expert, I just skip right. it and learn show it me by the, show heart. Show me the code, show me the example. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, my second one is a bit a paradox because my favorite guideline is like three words. And uh, I, I'm not sure if uh, Sean is here because it's no row loops. Yes. And <laughs> well, maybe it's more an idiom than a guideline really now, but I, I don't know what's, what to think of it. I, I, I love no raw loops but I actually still write some raw loops, even though no raw loops. I, I, I value simple rules when it's easy to know that there should be an exception. So the example I give in real life is, is never help without asking, okay? Like I'm, I'm almost 60 now. Sometimes when you think you're helping someone, they're not so grateful. So you should always check and say, do you want me to help you with this? Here's, here's some help I can offer you. But if I go past a car accident and someone is unconscious on the ground, I'm not gonna, like I can't get consent to phone for the fire department and ambulance, so I guess I'll just leave, right? Like I help, even though I couldn't ask. So, no raw loops. And then sometimes I write a raw loop. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Sometimes Thank I you. phone the fire department when someone's unconscious, but it should be at that level of an exception, right? Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you all very much.